Iron Maiden is one of the most successful heavy metal bands ever. They've sold more than 80 million albums and are renowned for their live shows. Tickets for which they say sell faster now than at any point in their 30 years as a band. My guest today is their lead singer, Bruce Dickinson. The only one of the band who's lopped off the long, hard-rocking hair. And that's because of his dual life. For when he's not on stage performing in front of thousands, he can often be found in a cockpit. He's a commercial pilot who's now set up his own aviation business. So how can you mix the hard rock lifestyle of a metalhead with the clean living required of a pilot and entrepreneur? Bruce Dickinson, welcome to Hard Talk. Oh, thank you very much. You do seem to have something of a double life. Which one is it that feels like more of a front, that heavy metal lead singer or the, the pilot and the entrepreneur? Well, it's strange because they both are, really. Both actually. are fronts. Well, in, in a sense, yes, because, you know, when you're, when, when you're performing on stage, in, you know, to all those people, um, yeah, you're performing. I, I and I, I liken it to, uh, to to blowing up an enormous bubble, uh, blowing up an enormous balloon. And as as you as you start off in small clubs and things like that, um, you can you know it seems intimidating, and then you get to theatres and that seems intimidating, and then you get to basketball arenas and that seems intimidating, and you get used to it. And what's happening is that your your awareness. Of, of how far your reach can go in terms of it, touching, communicating, emoting. And it is like blowing up a big balloon, if you like, and, and filling the space. Um, so to that extent, it, it, it is a front. It has to be. I mean, you couldn't possibly come off stage after being on stage in front of 50,000 people with the, you know, take a deep breath, inflating yourself out to all these people and, and come off stage and be like that in that state um, off stage and, and, and survive any kind of rational life whatsoever you'd go absolutely okay. bonkers but, but, and people have done of course in the okay past. so that's a front but what about the pilot then is that a front well um, I, I think uh, pilots uh, obviously lots of people are very nervous flyers so they tend to imbue pilots with certain characteristics uh, and uh, like um, you know, uh, uh, godlike infallibility and things like that, all of which is complete nonsense. Pilots, of course, are fallible and just as uh, of just as prone to human weakness as as, as everybody else. You know, so uh, I always think that the, this the, the, you know, the, the image that people have of of uh, of perfection and things like that in pilots, which is what they want to believe. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's it's not it's not strictly correct okay. at all. Uh, but and when people on your planes have heard your pilot today is Bruce Dickinson, mm. what sort of reactions have you had? Mm. Well, uh, this is this is the worrying thing. You see, um, there was a recent case in which uh, you know a, a depressurisation occurred and all the oxygen masks dropped, and most of the passengers, you know, when they woke up uh, after putting the oxygen mask on, had never listened to the bit that says pull the mask sharply towards your face to start the flow of oxygen. They'd missed that bit. They'd probably also forgotten who the pilot was and what the weather was at the desti yes, destination. But, but uh, Bruce Dickinson is quite well known, no, and you're also it, known as a pilot. And I wonder, have you ever had people trying to get into the cockpit or nervous because they thought, oh, my God, the lead singer of Iron Maiden's flying this plane? Actually, well, no, I've never had anybody nervous. I have thrown a pe few people off my aircraft on occasions for being drunk, but that's a totally separate issue. But do people, have you ever been recognised as a... Yes, you know, it's very strange. I, um, we used to operate a lot to Sierra Leone, and uh, I, I was forever flying to and from Sierra Leone over the course of about eight years, and would quite often stay down there and everything. And I met, um, I met a guy from my, uh, from, who was a classmate um, at, at school with me, uh, who was on his way down there, um, and he, he was a vicar. By now, and uh, you know, um, and, and he was a, I forget what, it might have been Kenyan or Nigerian, I think, originally, you know, uh, whatever. They had a most fabulous name, um, it was a tremendously long name, and I remember it to this day. And, and uh, 
and uh, uh, Bimbi Claude Gary Abayomi, Bimbi Claude Gary Charles Abayomi Cole. I was like, fantastic name. And um, so when somebody passed me the thing and said, uh, this chap's, you know, sat on the flight, can he have a quick word just before you close the door? Because obviously, you know, you, you can't open the door anymore yeah. because of all the terrible things that happened in 9-11. Um, yeah, he stuck his head. I've had about three or four guys, actually, who have and been no, ex-school ex, ex, right. uh, with me. Right. I've, I've flown them on people holiday. Who, and people, therefore, who know that, actually, you have this life on stage, a phenomenal life which you've had for 30 years. I want to play us a clip to, to show, to remind people what you do on stage. And this, right. is, this is a clip. It's your own song, a song you wrote, Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter. Let's, yes. let's take oh, a look right. at it. Oh, lovely. <laughs> Great. Hang on. It's getting close to me. Now, you've changed a bit since then. I have. I can't get away with not shaving anymore. Because? Well, well because, I mean, uh, back in the day, you know, I mean, you can sort of, you know, have the old beard. And you do look a bit like a sort of slightly misplaced version of Jesus, but not anymore. It's all a bit grey, I'm afraid. So, you know, it, it's sadly, it means I have to shave on a regular basis now. But you, but you didn't have to cut your hair, did you? No, I'll tell you what happened there. Um, I, um, I, 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 I quit Iron Maiden for about five years. Um, uh, much to and that was when you wrote that as well. I mean, you uh, subsequently recorded yeah, it with Iron Maiden. Yeah, it was. That was a yeah. It's it a long-winded roundabout story. That you know. But but anyway. Um, so so I quit Iron Maiden and I I embarked on a, a solo career, which uh, uh, initially had quite variable success, and and towards the end uh, got got quite satisfactory. Anyway, I had a very young band with me. When I say young, I'm talking sort of like uh, early twenties. And um, I, do, I recall uh, uh, a, a publicity shot we did, and, uh, and, and I was looking at it, I thought, wow, great shot, look at that, that's, that's great, that's, yeah, that's Alex, and that's, and, uh, who's that old geezer in the middle? I went, oh my God, it's me. And I thought, wow, that just doesn't look quite right. So I decided I, I, would, I would have a, a, bit, a bit of a chop. I mean, not, uh, you know, as short as it is now. And um, two things happened. One. Uh, somebody went, oh my God, you look 10 years younger. And I went, you may be right. Um, and the other thing which I found curious and actually very disappointing was that um, uh, people treated me in an entirely different manner um, to strangers, people like that. You know, people would smile at me more. Um, people, when you walk around a supermarket, I suddenly realized that before people were looking at me as if I was about to steal something. Uh, and, and, now, and now they didn't. And it was a curious and very disappointing discovery about human nature and the assumptions, the assumptions that people make, uh, which comes back to your earlier question about the front and, and this. It's assumptions that people make about things. They assume that entrepreneurs and businessmen are all going to be uh, honourable people. And in fact, you only have to read the newspapers to realise that, that just because you're wearing a suit and a tie doesn't mean you're honourable in any way, shape or form. Okay. Well, yeah. let's take a look at some of the assumptions people make about heavy metal rockers. Because you, I mean, there's phenomenal success that Iron Maiden's had over a very long time. 80 plus, 80 million yeah. at least albums. <clears throat> and you, and the band has said, and that's basically, I mean, when you look back at it, it's without any help from the mainstream media. Uh, it, well, probably, actually, it's actually been uh, of assistance not having help from the mainstream media, um, certainly in terms of the longevity of, of our career, because I think the, the mainstream media, uh, as in, you know, Simon Cowell's Big Friendly Giant Show or whatever it's called, you know, I mean, uh, you know, I mean all that sort of stuff, um, it assimilates whatever, whatever talent is, is available and then tries to just swallow it and regurgitate it in its own image. In other words, it owns it. Um, the media likes to own things and it likes to uh, play God. It, it builds things up and then it knocks things down. It likes to create this sort of drama in a way which fans 
don't want to do. They want to follow a story. They want, and, and you know, a band does have peaks and troughs. It makes some good albums. It makes some albums that are, yeah, not quite as good as the one before. But like a football team, if you're a fan of Chelsea, you're a fan of Chelsea. And, and, and win or lose, you're still a fan of the football team. But is that true of all media? Because your manager, Rod Smallwood, has said the UK press has historically been quite patronising about metal, and, mm. Iron Maiden, and Iron Maiden in particular. But you look elsewhere on the planet and we get three generations coming to see us. Yeah, well, we get three generations coming to see us in the UK. But I, I would say, yeah, sometimes we get, uh, sometimes we might get a, a, a nice ride uh, from the press. Uh, you know, I mean, I, whatever it was, I think a couple of years ago, it was like, it was like, oh, Iron Maiden, national treasures. You know, when you so, won a Brit Award for your life. Well, we did win a Brit Award, yeah, and and, and 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 things like that, and that's nice. It's great. I mean, we won an Ivan Novello Award, which actually was was the one that. And not being demeaning about the Brit Award, but the Ivan Novello Award was the one that meant more to me because it was genuinely from our peers, you know, if you like. Uh, although the Brit Award, again, you know, uh, I, actually, no, the Brit Award was actually voted for uh, by the people. I think it's probably one of the last times they'll allow that to happen, that make sure that we don't win it again, you know. So. But so what was it down to, the earlier success? You say, you know, mainstream media kept off, and, and in terms of radio, you didn't necessarily get that much featuring. It was, a lot of it was down to your tours from the look of it, and the fact that you survived the 80s when you were household name, but you were pretty clean living as a band, and, which would surprise me. No, I mean, you know, I mean, well, you're about as clean living as a, as a bunch of 25-year-olds let loose in America with, you know, lots of unlimited beer can be. I mean, the, the key is, you got, I mean, if you're in a band, let's face it, you're going to go out and have a great time the same way that a football team does or a rugby team does. It's a bunch of lads together, so of course you're going to go out and, and, and go and have a bit of playtime. But um, it's, what, it's, 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 it's what comes as your, your primary focus. And, and we would never let uh, the show or, you know, the gig or, you know, what we were doing suffer as a result of the extracurricular activity, because that's why we were there. Um, and I suppose it... Um, I used to read adverts when I was when I was at not adverts, um, articles when I was, uh, uh, you know, when I was a lad, and you'd read your... your you know, uh, you know uh, contemporary rock stars, and they'd say things like, "Oh, yeah, the reason that I got involved in uh, in rock and roll was so I could get laid." I was like, well, "That's a silly reason to get involved." I got involved because I wanted to play music, and I wanted to sing, and I wanted to create things, and and create stories in people's heads, and fantasies, and and and, and, and explore that, and and that's why I'm still doing it. You know, that the fact that I'm still grateful to be here with most of my marbles intact, and that I I actually can still do it. Uh, you know. But you've also, I mean, you're critical of the effect that Simon Cowell and the mass media has had on something. Something like The Voice. The BBC has this programme which is meant to be focused yeah, solely on I turn it down. And you say you take great Very pleasure sure, in I take that. Gr great pleasure in turning it down. I think it's, de I think it's demeaning. I mean, I mean, when I was a kid, again, there was a show called Opportunity Knocks. It was very cheesy, and it had a guy called Huey Green who presented it in black and white, and he goes, well, now it's Opportunity Knocks, you know, you know, a singing dolphin. Wow! You know, and to me, it's exactly the same. If people have got something to say, they should get out there and say it and just do it and be it and, 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 and stop worrying about instant gratuitous fame, because you can't tell me that um, the people that select these people, the people, the judges that set themselves up as, you know, with ridiculous names, you know, uh, 